All right, so quick show of hands. Who here is, is afraid of being buried alive? Good, good. All right, those of you who are not raising your hands, why the hell not? This is a terrifying thing that is completely reasonable to be afraid of. People have been afraid of premature burial since at least Roman times. Uh, back when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, it was not uncommon to go and check the tomb a couple days after you put a corpse in it to make sure they were still dead, because, you know, sometimes they weren't. So, <laughs> and so people have been afraid of this for a good long time, and the fear, in fact, has a name. The word taphophobia was coined during the Victorian era when the fear of being buried alive really hit its stride. And this was reasonable because medical technology at the time was not great, and sometimes it was hard to tell if a person was dead before they were buried. And another contributing factor to this fear was the rise of horror fiction with our boy Edgar Allan Poe, because he was notably freaked out about premature burial, and then he freaked out a lot of other people with stories like the cask of Amontillado and the fall of the House of Usher and... Well, the premature burial. <laughs> and when you're freaked out, you get inventive. And so this was the heyday of patented safety coffins that let the buried person ring a bell above the ground to let everyone know they weren't dead. And incidentally, if you have heard that this is where we get the phrases saved by the bell and dead ringer, it sounds really good and it's not true. Saved by the Bell is from boxing, and Dead Ringer comes from horse racing in an incredibly boring way. So, I'm sorry. It's boring, but it is true. Anyway, in the 18th and 19th centuries, taphophobia... <laughs> what? <laughs> For you, the bell tolls, my lady. <laughs> so, in the 18th and 19th centuries, taphophobia was a pretty hot fear, and anybody who was anybody had it. Let's take Hans Christian Andersen, for example. Now, here was a guy who wrote cuddly fairy tales about mermaids having their tongues cut out and abused children freezing to death in the snow. So what could he possibly be afraid of? Lots of things, as it turns out. Um, fire and dogs and having sex and contracting trichinosis from eating pork. But what he was really afraid of was being buried alive. But fortunately, he had a fail-proof system for preventing such an unfortunate event, which was to nap with a note reading, I only appear to be dead. <laughs> Worked every time. So when he was on his deathbed at a friend's house, he begged that she would cut his veins open after he was dead just to make sure that he was fully cleared for burial. And she joked that she would just put his I'm not dead card next to him. The fun times they had. <laughs> so the Polish composer Frederick Chopin was also afraid of being buried alive, possibly because he was so sickly during his life that people had a hard time telling whether he was still alive. His girlfriend, George Sahn, for example, used to call him her beloved little corpse. <laughs> so before he died, he wrote, the earth is suffocating, swear to make them cut me open so I won't be buried alive. But after he, di after he died, things got weird. Chopin specified that his heart should be cut out before he was buried to make sure that he was actually dead. And he also asked that it be sent back to Poland since he knew that the rest of his body would end up in Paris. So they did. They cut his heart out. And his eldest sister smuggled it back home in a jar of cognac, as you do. <laughs> and now it's buried inside a pillar in a church in Warsaw. So, fun fact, during World War II, the Nazis stole Chopin's heart. No, literally, they stole his physical heart because they worried that it would be a rallying point for occupied Poland because Chopin is a Polish national hero. They love him. Uh, but I digress. George Washington is another celebrity taphophobe. A few hours before his death, he told his secretary, have me decently buried and do not let my body be put into the vault in less than three days after I am dead. So three days is a long time to have a corpse around, but once again, things were about to get weirder. While Washington was lying in state, a friend of his dropped by, uh, the guy who designed the Capitol building, incidentally, and offered to bring the president back from the dead.
This procedure would have apparently involved many blankets, lots of rubbing, a bellows, and a transfusion of lamb's blood. The Washington family respectfully declined this generous and highly scientific offer. So if you needed more reasons not to leave your dead body lying around for three days, add your well-meaning zombie-making friends to the list. But still, Washington was outdone by the philosopher Schopenhauer, who really was a gloomier person in general. He asked that his corpse be kept around for a full five days before it was buried. So that led to some fairly gruesome stories about his wake, including one where his stu students were keeping vigil and they heard a noise come from the body and they saw that his expression had changed from peaceful repose to a horrible grimace and they thought he had come back to life. But then they realized that decomposition had made his dentures pop out of his mouth and onto the floor. So Schopenhauer may have thrown some incredibly bad post-mortem parties, but weirdly, he was not that far out of step with German thinking at the time. In 1791, the German government built the first Leichenhaus, or waiting mortuary, which was this elegant hall where corpses were laid out until they showed very obvious signs of decay and were therefore ready to be buried. And each corpse had a string attached to their finger, which if pulled would ring a very loud and very scary alarm bell, which would summon one of the 24-hour watchmen. Unfortunately, the Lichen House wasn't very effective, not least because it smelled disgusting and people thought it was too horrible a place to bring their dead loved ones to. But during a hundred years of operation in multiple German cities, nobody ever woke up in one. <laughs> now, despite that, one Lichen House superintendent wrote about one of the notable success stories. There was this girl who didn't show any signs of decay for nine whole days. And then, when her family was visiting her, um, she exploded. <laughs> so if that's your success story, <laughs> um, it's not really a surprise that the Lichen House didn't last that much longer. Um, so at this point, you're probably not feeling too good about leaving your body around until it's obviously ready to go in the ground. But the question is, does premature burial actually happen? And I am sorry, but the answer is yes. Uh, William Tebbs' 1905 study found evidence of 222 very close shaves and 149 actual live burials. So what could cause someone to be buried alive? Um, in the past, you could chalk it up to insufficient medical, tech, medical knowledge or technology. And then there are conditions that can look a lot like death, like comas or catalepsy, which turns your limbs rigid and dramatically slows your breathing. So in 1915 in South Carolina, Essie Dunbar was declared dead after having a seizure, and she was buried before her sister could arrive for the funeral. And when her sister did get there, she asked, that Essie be dug up so that she could have one last look at her. And when the coffin was opened, Essie sat up and smiled at everybody. And as you've probably guessed, she went on to live another 47 years <laughs> and outlived the doctor who declared her dead. <laughs> but that was 100 years ago, right? We don't need to be afraid in our age of modern medicine. I am so sorry to tell you this. But these things do still happen. Um, in 2008, a woman named Velma Thomas died of a heart attack, and I mean died. No pulse, no brain activity, no nothing. And after 17 hours of being clinically dead, she just woke up on her own. Mrs. Thomas is the record-holding example of Lazarus syndrome, in which a patient, a patient spontaneously revives after failed CPR. And it's been documented at least 38 times since 1982. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so granted, even if that happens to you, because of the way we handle death these days, you are less likely to be buried alive and more likely to wake up in the morgue or the funeral home. In 2014 alone, that happened to this gentleman in Kenya and a lady in Poland and a guy in Mississippi. But in Greece that year, a woman actually was buried alive and she was not dug up in time to save her life. So that was horrible. And you are probably more afraid of being buried alive now. 
I guess the good news is that if you choose to be embalmed, you'll die from that instead. <laughs> Not helping? Okay, so let me remind you that there are tried and true historic methods for preventing premature burial. Number one, you can wear a polite note while you sleep. <laughs> Number two, you can have your sister cut your heart out and bury it in a church in Poland. Or number three, you can have your mopey philosophy students hang out with your corpse for five days. So those are your options. You know, take your pick. They're all good. But in the meantime, I will leave you with a toast from my great uncle Neil, because uncle Neil is 96 years old, and whenever you ask him how he is, he says, I'm still on the right side of the grass. <laughs> so raise your glasses, please, because right here and right now, we are all still on the right side of the grass. <laughs>